Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 53. Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 53. Hope you are doing well. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Chris Chillingworth. This is a podcast dedicated to my journey of turning 4K into £1,024,867 trading in UK stocks. Uh, But it is also largely a podcast about the analysis of UK stocks, how to find the right companies, and really just the kind of general... Uh, mindset and approach to successful long-term investing. Now, I have managed to turn 4K into around £28,000 so far, so we're on target, we're doing really well, uh, and we've been doing well now since kind of 2018, 2019, things have been going very well, despite the market being in what I would describe as quite a lot of turmoil, uh, we've still been achieving growth and doing doing very well. Uh, but I am very much a student of this journey, of this game as well. Uh, I, I read a lot of books uh, by the likes of Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, Phil Carey, anybody who uh, has done well and has achieved what I aspire to achieve. And I tend to use that same approach in many aspects of life. You know, if I want to lose weight, I'll find somebody who has lost a lot of weight and is in great shape now. If I want financial advice, I'll go to somebody who has done very well with their finances. You know, it's it's and it's is that that approach of who am should I be listening to here? Because there are in we're in an industry where so many people have an opinion on what you should do. Even people in the pub, I've met many people who have come to me and they've said they've asked me, "What do you do for a living?" And I was explaining, I I analyze stocks and I invest in stocks, and they then tell me their stock picks. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, do you invest then? They're like, well, no, no. But, you know, and it's crazy that uh, everyday people seem to have an idea, you know, an opinion on what you think they should buy uh, on the markets. And I tend to not listen to those people. I remember one day having the builders round and uh, we were having an extension done on the property. I've talked about this a lot, a lot, but, uh, one of the builders who came in, this was over like a year, we had a load of work done over a year, so many different people, many different builders and contractors coming in, and one of these guys came in and asked me, whilst he was on a little break, um, what do you do? And I explained what I did, and he said, nah, you want to get into Bitcoin, mate? And I was like, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I don't. <laughs> but he was like, no, that's where, it's, that's where it's all at. Bitcoin is the future. Like, you want to get out of stocks, you want to get into Bitcoin. And I just thought, well, you know, without wanting to be rude, you are you're a labourer for a building company. So why would I, if, if this was accurate information, if, if you were making millions out there, maybe I would, my ears would prick up and I'd pay more attention. But... Without, you know, sounding rude, because I've done labouring jobs. I used to be a cleaner at a holiday camp when I was 16, 17 years old. I've done loads of jobs over the years to make money. You know, I'm not not beating on that. But you have to look at who's giving you this advice and what have they achieved and what have they done. Is the advice they, they're giving you just something they've made up in their heads to sound more intelligent? Or have they actually made, you know, achieved the things that they're talking about? Well, this guy didn't strike me as somebody who'd made a fortune on Bitcoin. So forgive me if I'm not going to take his advice on my investing decisions. And I see people on Facebook taking investment advice from people on Facebook or giving investment investment advice. Well, why w- I would never go on Facebook and give invest- investment advice because if you're somebody who's taking ad- investment advice off someone, on Facebook, you're asking for trouble, you know, you don't know who that person is, you don't know what they've achieved. And so I tend to look at the greats, the people who I know have done particularly well. And the the thing, the real thing is here, you don't really need to listen to that many people. Once you listen to a two or three, you see there are patterns. When you look at and you read and you listen to all the interviews and articles and books and stuff that Warren Buffett has done over the last 30, 40 years, and then you listen to Phil Carey and, and and Charlie Munger and Peter Lynch and all these other people that have done tremendously well 
investing for the long term, you notice they're all saying exactly the same thing. And if you adopt that, if you can apply that to your investing, you're going to do all right. You're going to do pretty well. And so I consider myself absolutely a student of this 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 environment, this game. Uh, but I love what I'm doing. And I feel like my results so far have proven that it works. That what I've learned from them has worked. And I am just simply passing it down to other people. Uh, and helping them to find the right companies to invest in. And the analysis is 100% for me, predominantly. I started at analyzing stocks for my own investing. That is 100% pure selfishness. I didn't start analyzing stocks thinking this is going to help anyone else. It was purely for my own investing, for my own profits. And it wasn't until I felt comfortable that I was onto something, that I was doing well, that I was even willing to share it with my friends um, and my family. And I started to do so. I started to, I, I created a little email list and I had literally like eight people on this list that I just started sending the information to. And they were like, yeah, this is really cool. This is really good information. Cheers. Didn't charge them for it. It's just, you know, I just shared it with them uh, because they were interested in investing in stocks and they didn't have the time to do the investment, you know, the analysis themselves and the research themselves. And so I just started sharing what I was doing with them. And it was fun. It was fun to share that information. It was fun to add value. It was fun to feel like I was helping, you know. Uh, but don't get me wrong, 100%, the whole process was, for me, predominantly first, you know. Uh, and it still is. All the work that I do, all the analysis I do, I'm I'm thinking of my members, but I am absolutely 100% using this information for myself, first and foremost. I then share that information with my clients to then use how they see fit with their own portfolios. You know, which companies are great right now, which ones are priced at the right level at the moment, which ones are overpriced, uh, what are the companies we need to be staying well away from, all that kind of information. And I use it just as much as they do. Um, and and that's kind of how this thing, this this whole process has been, been born and how I've ended up doing this podcast eventually, you know. So um, today I want to talk primarily about financial uh, summaries or should I say newsletters because I've been receiving loads recently. I think it's something to do with marketing. Uh, they, they like to tailor marketing to people now that they think fits with that individual and it's very clever technology and it's it's often you know, quite accurate, you know. Uh, a lot of people think that Facebook's listening to them and I honestly couldn't tell you if it is or isn't but uh, I was talking to uh, my partner a little while ago about going away somewhere um, and she was talking about getting a, a like a lodge in the forest and I was thinking yeah this sounds quite good and we just had this conversation and I swear <laughs> I went on Facebook and I'm getting adverts for lodges in forests and I'm thinking how the hell like uh, were they is this confirmation bias were they already there but now I'm just noticing them or is there something more sinister going on? Who knows? Uh, it's difficult to really say. But for a while now, I've been receiving uh, or, or being shown articles by uh, companies like The Motley Fool and companies like that that are trying to tell me, you know, the top three stocks to buy in October or the best AIM stock to buy in 2023. And I used to, I, I have this little thing that I do where I go and read those articles because I'm intrigued as to what they're suggesting we buy. I'm then cross-referencing that with my analysis because I've analysed every FTSE stock in the UK and I have already sat down and looked at that company at some point in the past and written all my notes on them. I've got all my financials. I've got it all on a, on a database and I can go into that company. I can look at my notes and I can look at why I did or didn't like that stock. The vast majority of them I don't. Out of nearly a thousand companies, only 50 I've ever liked. But it's fascinating to me that somebody, you know, a company like the Motley Fool, one of their writers, these are freelance writers, by the way. They're not necessarily experts. I want to make that clear as well because people assume they're coming from a point of authority because they, it's the Motley Fool website. They assume these people are well-respected investors writing these articles. They're not. Some of them might be, but they've got people writing for them that they don't really know what they're talking about. 
And I know that because I was employed to do it for a while, not by Motley Fool, uh, but I was working for a magazine. Uh, this was back in, I think, probably 2015, 2016. I was writing articles for a magazine. Uh, it was a spread betting magazine. And it was the largest selling spread betting magazine at the time. And they approached me and they said to me, would you be... In I had a blog. I was writing a blog on the website, on my website. And uh, they obviously found me. They might have found my YouTube and my blog that are articles that I was writing. And they said, would you be interested in writing articles for the magazine? And it was just, it was an email. And I thought, mm, maybe, because I write anyway. And it would be quite cool. And it might, uh, it's just something that I've never done before. And they were going to pay me something tiny, like 150 quid an article or something. It wasn't wasn't for the money that I was doing it at all. Uh, it was just purely the enjoyment of writing an article for a magazine. I thought it was quite cool. And I did that for probably the best part of a year before I quit. Obviously, there are deadlines when it comes to this sort of stuff. And life started to get in the way a little bit. I think maybe I missed a deadline and got a lot of stick for it from them, understandably. And I kind of felt like, you know what, if I can't commit to the, doing this properly, I'll, I just, I'm not going to do it at all. And I then ended up just saying, like, I'm not I'm not going to be doing it anymore. Um, and I, I stopped, I think it was 2017, 2018. It wasn't long after that that I stopped spread betting. So I think it's probably in conjunction with falling out of love of short term, trying to, to kind of profit from short term market moves, which I found I was quickly finding. I say quickly, it took me six years, <laughs> but... I eventually discovered that that's not the way to go and that it's almost impossible to predict what's going to happen in the short term. Uh, and I came away from it. But I, you know, I was still only a couple of years into spread betting and now I'm writing an article for a magazine on it. You know, it doesn't really doesn't take much to move up in the world and, and do things like that. My point being that these articles that are being written saying this is the best stock to buy in 2023, you don't know who's writing that. So that you might have the name of the author, but you don't know what they've achieved. Are they, is that are they profitable? If they have got a healthy, growing investment portfolio, have they done really well over the last ten, fifteen years? Are they great at stock picking? Uh, and largely, often, none of those are true. And I will take that company that they've recommended, and I'll cross-reference that with my analysis, and I'll literally be, literally, I have no idea why they're recommending that company. I talked about this in my book in length, uh, my book called The Clean Guide to Invest in Your Money in the Stock Market by Chris Chillingworth, available on Amazon and all good bookshops. <laughs> but um, I, I wrote about this in the book about how these companies are recommending comp other, uh, other stocks uh, and they, they're, they don't have your best interests at heart. Of course they don't. They're just looking to fill articles and get clicks. They want traffic. If you make money or lose money on an investment you make off the back of that article, they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. They, they're not interested whether or not you make money or you lose money. They're just interested in the traffic. Clicks. And so the there's no incentive there for them to pick the right companies. And they can't possibly do it. Because having done having looked at a thousand companies in the FTSE markets, I've only found 50 I'd ever touch. Of those, only maybe, I think we're now at 40% of those 50 stocks are priced at a level that makes sense to buy at right now. So you're looking at 20 companies, probably, that right now are wonderful stocks that you, we, we would want to invest in, that are priced at a level that makes sense to buy. So right now we're spoiled for choice because we've got 20 companies out there out of the whole FTSE market that we would be buying right now if we had capital available each month. And, and me and my clients actively are buying every month. But if you've only got 20 companies and you've got 365 days of the year to write articles for, you're going to struggle. You can't keep writing articles about the same companies. And so and if you go to websites like the Motley Fool, they're churning out articles every day of the week. So they've got to churn out, and it's usually more than one a day. It's usually two or three a day. So you're looking at between 365 to, what, 700 articles a year being churned out. Well, there's only a 1,000 stocks to pick from. So you're going to find that a lot of their articles are suggesting stocks you shouldn't be touching. 
and I found that is absolutely the case on the majority of occasions. So much so that you can't trust them. You can't rely on them. And then when you read the reports or read the articles, they if you read everything that they, they discuss, very rarely are they talking about financial performances. Most of the time they're talking about opinion, what they think is going to happen. Uh, just today I was looking at an article about a marine company and the author who was working for the Motley Fool was talking about how uh, this is a stock where they produce this certain type of technology. There are 26 million vessels in the water. Only half a million currently use this technology. Therefore, there's this wide gaping market that is ripe for adopting this technology. And they believe this company are going to fill that gap and they're going to be superb in the future. And they're trading at 45 pence a share or something like that. Well, looking at the financials of this company, they've made they've been hemorrhaging money every year they've been losing millions and millions of pounds not making any profit at all that's the first thing secondly who says that the companies who says that these vessels are going to want this new technology it might be better doesn't mean it's going to be adopted uh, or have the budget to pay for it just because there is a market out there doesn't mean you are obviously going to fill it and so that's a bit of a jump. It's a bit of a stretch from this is a company losing a lot of money to this is a company that's going to be making loads of profit because of these ideas. And instead, what I prefer to do is I think these ideas are fine, by the way. like I, I think it's healthy to have ideas on what might happen. But however, where instead of this person saying buy this company now at 45 pence a share and you make loads of money when all this stuff kicks in, I prefer to wait until the financials show that that is happening, that your opinion, your ideas have been validated. And so people will say to me, well, it's too late because now the share price is up to £2 a share and you missed the boat. Well, no, if this is a company that are doing well, yes, you're right, I'm a little bit late to the party, but I'd rather there be a party because the vast majority of these small stocks don't do well. And you can sit there and speculate about these companies and find they they don't go anywhere. The amount of emails I've had from people who have listened to this podcast and they've reached out to me and said, I bought this company, can you take a look at them? I bought them at 45p, it's now down to 5p a share. Um, Should I sell it or should I hold on? Because they bought this company and when you ask them why, they really don't have a valid reason as to why they bought it. They just thought they were going to do well. They would have had some idea in their head of why. But the financials were always atrocious. This is a company hemorrhaging money for years. Always seems to be the case. And I said, well, what was it about them that you wanted, you know, you thought you should buy them? And they couldn't tell me. And, well, they didn't really have a very strong reason behind it. And they couldn't do, because when you look at the financials, you can see, well, at the time that they bought these shares, this was a company that were hemorrhaging money, that were making nothing. They were losing money every single year. And so there's no justification to buy a share like that. Because what do you expect? And if you, the reason you bought that stock is because you thought things were going to turn around in the future, well then you're going to get bitten if that is your investment strategy. If you're going to buy a failing business in the hope that it's going to turn around and do well in the future, that's a big risk. You're taking huge risks. Whereas my approach to this is it's okay to have these ideas that this company are going to do well, but wait until you see that happening in the financials before you actually jump. You need to see revenue slowly grow, going up. You want to see the profits are improving. You want to see that they're take, they've got money left over at the end of each year to reinvest into their own growth. You want to understand their five-year growth strategy or whatever growth strategy they're currently employing. What is their plan for growth? This would all be written in, it should be written in the annual report that they release every year. They should be explaining to shareholders how they intend to grow. Do those plans make sense? Or are they insane? (laughs) You know, the amount of annual reports I've read where the idea behind their growth doesn't make any sense. Why would you grow like that? Why would you invest in that instead of this? And, you know, and you've got to understand that concept and those businesses. But these guys aren't talking about any of that sort of stuff. They're talking about this is a stock that's going to do well because we're they're releasing a new product and 
there's loads of customers out there for this product. It's like, well, great, but that doesn't mean the customer is going to suddenly buy it. That's not a reason to invest at all. And it just makes me very wary of these articles that come out because they have to produce so many. So it can't the 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 the, the quantity is the primary focus, not the quality. Because if they've got to produce 700 articles a year, they're going to have to recommend companies that they're not really great stocks. And I think the last and final real telltale sign about all this is that when you look at the bottom of the article and it states in small writing, and it will say, so-and-so, the author, or this author, does not hold any shares in these companies. And I think to myself, well... When I do my analysis and I say, this is a company that's ticking all my boxes, they look great, and the share price is really solid right now, I'm doing that for me. I'm looking at this from my point of view of thinking, all right, I'm really interested in this stock right now. I would buy this stock, and I may have even bought this stock. And my clients, every month, they get a report from me that shows all the stocks I own, how much I own, what I've bought that month, what I've sold that month. Typically, I don't typically sell any stocks but uh, and they see the whole makeup of my portfolio so I stand by the analysis that I do but these guys they recommend companies and they don't even buy them themselves they don't own any of the share any shares in these companies yet they're writing in articles telling you you should be buying them well if they're not good enough for you why would they be good enough for me that's mental, in my opinion. And it just goes to show the caliber and the quality of those articles and the stock picks themselves. If they're, pick, if they're saying, this is a wonderful stock, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're going to be great in 10 years, well, why haven't you bought them then? Why don't you own any shares in that company? Because the answer to that question will tell you just how good that company really is. Put your money where your mouth is, that's what I say. Um <clears throat> And so I don't use these kind of articles. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki, I'm not a massive fan of Robert Kiyosaki. I think he talks a lot of rubbish sometimes. But I read his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, when I was going through my years of self-development and learning about financial education. And that book really did help me. I think it's a very pivotal, pivotal, important book for people with no financial or very little financial education. Um, It teaches some really important financial points that are solid and in that book he quotes several times the reason why investors think trading in stocks is risky is because they're taking massive risks and by massive risks he means they don't know what they're doing when you buy stocks without knowing why or what you're doing you deserve to lose money and the legendary investor warren buffett once said on t on a tv interview that i watched that he believed that probably over 95 percent of investors do not read a company's financial statement that to me is insanity how could you invest in a company without reading the financial statement that's the 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 starting point to buying a company it's the first thing you should be doing is checking the finances and seeing how financially and what what the performance of that business is that you're investing in but he, from his experience, he's saying he believes 95% of investors don't read them, which that's a lot of people, if that is true. And it's astonishing just how, is lazy the right word? How lazy investors can be? I think it probably rub the people's backs up the wrong way if I say that, but um, it is it's laziness. It's people buying stocks without really being bothered to, to look into those companies properly. And I've, you know, I've felt fallen foul of that in my early days. I <laughs> invested in companies I didn't even know what they did. <laughs> I bought shares in companies. I bought a share, shares in a company in America called Dollar Tree. And I didn't have a clue what they did. <laughs> if anyone had asked me, I wouldn't have been able to tell them. And I just bought them. I think it's probably based on a share price move or something. Or maybe an article I read. I don't, honestly don't know. I can't remember. But this is my really early days of investing when I just didn't know what I was doing. I was just throwing my money at stuff basically and I got out of that those shares once I started to learn the importance of knowing what you own I started getting rid of the shares that I knew nothing about or perhaps I'd done some analysis on the company and realized I wasn't interested and so sold them 
the very early days of my investing, but I did the same, made the same mistakes as, as everybody. Um, but I think the number of articles that are out there that are suggesting all these stocks you should buy, they exist because people are clicking on them. If they didn't, if no one ever clicked on these articles, then they wouldn't bother producing them. They know what works. They know what articles are getting the most clicks. They see all that data, all the metrics. And I think it's, it's it shows what's going on in the world in that the vast majority of investors are getting their information from these kinds of articles and they're losing money. And sometimes they'll make money and they'll think, oh, this is great. Like, this article really helped me. And then they'll lose money on another one and then lose money on another one and then they'll think, oh, actually, I'm not quite so impressed anymore. But now we're five years down the line and you've wasted five years of investing picking the wrong companies. That's quite a cost. That time is quite a cost. You don't get those five years back. You can get money back, but you can't get time back. And that's quite important. And you see these kind of articles on Yahoo Finance, Trading View, Market Watch. There's loads. I mean, I, I'm on Facebook, scrolling on Facebook, and I'll see an article from Motley Four come up, you know, telling me the top three stocks of October 2023. And it's like, they must get so many clicks on those so many people taking that information in and making their investment decisions off the back of them but as I've said already in this episode those articles are full of flaws I think it's really important if you are beginning to invest in stocks and I know a number of people number of people listening to this podcast are starting off on their journey and that's how they've come to kind of come across this podcast in the first place if you are looking to invest in stocks do your own research because if you don't and and here's the thing if you don't have the time to do your own research you either need to quit and stop investing in stocks because you're going to lose your money otherwise or you need to find somebody who can do it for you and yes it sounds like a walking advert for what I do and I guess it is in a way um but if you don't want to join my membership, if you don't want to be part of that, or you can't afford it right now, it's not the right time, whatever, then as an aside, like as a as a backup to that, do your own research. Here's what you need to be doing. You need to be looking at the company financials. Absolutely. Teach yourself how to learn how to read financial statements. Like you need to understand how that company is performing. And you need to be going back years to see how it's been formed not just the last year because any year can be up or down you want to see a wider picture a trend how is this company performing has it been profitable for a long time have they got a company record and success rate of being a profitable business because if you just look at 2022 or 2023's data and they've made a profit it's like well they made a profit that year but I've seen many companies that have been losing and hemorrhaging money for years, and then one year they just get a little boost or something. Or some sell. Here's the thing: they might have sold off an asset of their business. Let's say a company turns around and says, "You know what? We're going to move out of America because things aren't going in the right direction. We're hemorrhaging money here. Let's sell off our American arm of our business and just focus on the UK." So they're downsizing. Now they sell off the American part of their business. They sell off all their assets. You know, all their light, rights and licenses, their intangibles, uh, the property, the plant, the equipment, the inventory, the staff that they're no longer paying. They've cut costs dramatically. And all of the income from the sale of all that property and, and all the assets that they owned comes into their accounts that year as profit. They've made a load of extra money this year. And so they're profitable. But the wider picture shows that this is a company going in the wrong direction. Because now they're downsizing, they're not expanding, they're shrinking. They've been hemorrhaging money every single year up to this point. This is income that's coming in that can't be relied upon in years to come. This is a one-off income that's this year made it look profitable. But you know, as an investor, now that money has come in, that's not going to be repeated. There's no Once they've sold their American arm of their business, there's, no, there's not another American arm that they can sell off next year. It's gone. And so next year, they're going to go back to losing money again, unless there's some huge fundamental change in what they're doing, which is unlikely. And so 
you wouldn't invest in a company like that because they're going in the wrong direction. But if you only looked at one year's worth of data, you could easily be mis you could easily uh, be misled by thinking this is a company doing well. And there are a load of aspects in the financials that show so much information. Is revenue going up or is it going down or is it stagnant? Why is it stagnant? Is this a company making profit? Are they reinvesting back into their own business with those profits? What are they doing with those profits? Where are those profits going? This is information you have to know about the company you're investing in. Otherwise, you're investing blind. And if you're investing blind, don't expect to do well. I honestly mean that because... You will you will pick a couple of winning companies. You pick a few, you probably pick more losing companies than winning. Why? Because that is the that is what the the field looks like. If you look at a thousand stocks and only fifty of them are companies I would want to invest in, of which of those only twenty of them are priced right at the moment, we're saying that out of a thousand companies, only twenty of them are priced at a level that makes sense to buy right now. So if you're going to go in blind. What are the odds that you're going to find one of those 20 stocks? Obviously, extremely low. So if you're going to go in and you're not even going to look, do any research on the underlying business itself, and you're just going to buy based on share price or the brand or that you like the product or the service that they deliver, or you've read an article online that says they're doing really well, you're going to lose money. Because you're going to pick one of the 980 other stocks that I wouldn't be touching right now. Or you're going to pick a company that aren't that bad, but you've massively overpaid for them on share price. Because you don't know how to analyse what's the right price to be paying. And you are, you'll be very, very lucky if you do well without doing any analysis. And if you, you listen to Warren Buffett, you listen to Peter Lynch, you listen to Phil Carey, Charlie Munger, all of these people that I follow, one of the biggest rules is know what you're buying. It's crucial. And it's the same if a friend of yours turned around and said, I've got this chip shop I'm trying to sell. I've got a guy working behind the, ta the, the, the counter. He's great at it. He's, do he's, he's there for life if you want him. You don't have to you know cook any chips. I just want someone to come in and buy the business off me. One of the first things you want to do is check the books. Is this a company that's making any money? Is the value of this business going to go up over the 10, 20 years? Am I going to make any capital gains or gain in equity? Or are they making good profit? Am I going to get a good income from this? What's my return on investment? Whether it's in equity or cash, I need to know. Because I know that, that you need to know that. If you're going to go into that investment completely blind and go, yeah, yeah, I'll buy it. And don't even look at the books then don't be surprised when you find out there's a company that are making massive losses and now you've got to pay for those losses. Or have got massive debts overhanging them. You know, you've got to check this stuff. And you would check this stuff if you were an everyday investor and that was a situation. Well, you've got to apply the same to stocks or any investments you're making. Whether you invest in art or whiskey barrels or um, jewellery, whatever. You need to know what you're investing in. You need to understand that business. Otherwise, you're going to get burnt. And I'm saying stay away from these articles because they're not helping you. There's no incentive there for them to get you rich. They're just looking for clicks. And so, therefore, the caliber of what they're going to be sharing is not going to be great. But I'm also saying that if you're a beginner, the research is key. You have to learn what you're, in, you're investing in. And if you can't... If you don't want to use anything like what I'm doing or you don't have any alternative and you don't have the time to do the research yourself, you should probably stop because you're going to lose your money. And I know that's probably hard for people to hear. Um, perhaps a little shocking, I don't know. But it's the truth and I'm just being honest. Find another investment that you do understand or you can learn about. And you can learn about this stuff. You know, I didn't know about stocks probably 15, 20 years ago. Um, I wouldn't have known how to read a financial statement. It would have made gobbledygook to me. I would have looked at it and gone, what, is this? what does it mean? Um, I went to college and I started studying accounting. I got my accounting qualifications. I learned how to do all this stuff. Uh, I read books. I read as many books as I could get my hands on, on this subject. And I spent 10 years doing it in various different guises and various, various different strategies and different ways. But I learned how to do it. And 
you can either do that yourself and follow that journey or take advantage of what I've done and use my experience, use my knowledge to guide your your way forward. But don't go out blind. If you if you're going if you're doing this blind and you don't know what you're doing and you're just buying stocks willy nilly, you're probably not going to do well in the long term. And I would recommend maybe thinking about doing something different. That's just my honest opinion. I'm just being I don't want to pull people away from investing in stocks, but I'd rather people didn't lose money when, you know, it wasn't unnecessary to do so. Find something find an investment opportunity where you do know what you're doing. Maybe you're better suited to property or something like that, perhaps. But again, even with property, I've got a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, who is a very good property developer. And she has spent many years now learning how to do it. And there, this is a, a market where many people are dropping out of the property market. Landlords are falling like flies right now because they've realized it's not financially viable for them. And she says, no, if you know what you're doing, if you know how to find the right opportunities, if you do your research, there are great opportunities out there to make a lot of money. But most people don't know how to do that research. And so they don't they don't find those opportunities. They don't find those properties that can make them a lot of money. And it's the same sort of thing so with any investment. You need to understand the underlying investment that you're, you're putting your money into. Uh, you need to know it well. And with stocks, it's learning the businesses, learning the companies that you're investing in. What's going on with those companies? I'm going to wrap it up now because I've been waffling for way too long. But I hope this episode has added some value. It's given you something to think about. Uh, if you are interested in getting involved in what I do, you can email me at chris at chrischillingworth.com. Uh, or you can go to the website chrischillingworth.com. And we can have a chat and go from there. We're not actively open. There's no open to the membership. But what the way I like to do things, I like to chat to people, find out if it's right for them, are they the right kind of fit. Every now and again, we have an opportunity to bring people in. Often when I haven't brought people in for a little while, it gives me some time to get on with other things. When people come in, I have to give them a bit of a, a hand-holding process. I kind of, uh, there's a lot of questions. There's, you know, We often have a look at the portfolios that they have together and help them for, pick through their portfolio. Um, and to help them identify what they should be buying and what they should maybe be getting rid of and that kind of stuff. And that takes a lot of my time up. And so I don't tend to bring people on too often. I also want to make sure that we're only bringing in people that get it. You know, I've had people that have joined the membership and then after a month they're like, well, the results aren't that good. And I'm like, it's been a month. This is like a 20 year journey. And th 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 their expectations are just completely wildly off to what, you know what to expect what they should be expecting and i've had people that have joined that are interested in short-term results and they're using my analysis for short-term results well that's not what it's for it's not going to work that way and so the short-term markets are volatile they go up and down all over the place and so i want to make sure that only the right people are coming in because that's just hassle and then i'm getting emails from people that are complaining that it's not uh they haven't made money in their first month and I'm like well <laughs> no you won't probably won't you know this is a long term journey and that's not partly on me because I've obviously not put, I've not delivered and communicated that properly uh, before they joined and so now I'm a lot more um, hot on who's joining and where are they from and what's their journey so far and what's their mindset do they understand what this is all about do they have the right attitude to do well here are they going to get on well with the group? Uh, we've got 110 members now from all over the place, and we have a community and a chat room that they all use, and you know, and we're building it and building it and building it, and eventually it's going to be in-person meets and stuff like that, which we call. But yeah, if you're interested, basically, what I'm saying is email me. Let's chat because um, it's closed to the public, but I like to advertise it on the podcast because typically people who are listening to the podcast they get it. Because they've been listening to me talk about it. So they understand where I'm coming from. They understand uh, the the mindset required. The expectations. And so people listening to this podcast are more geared towards being part of this. What I'm building. Because they're already on board with the mindset that I need. If that makes any sense. Or they've learned the correct mindset to have. So chris at chrischillingworth.com is the email. That's chris at chrischillingworth, C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G 
W O R T H. That's all one word, Chris Chillingworth. Dot com. Drop me a line and we'll chat. And um, and thank you so much for choosing to tune into this particular podcast. I know everybody has busy lives and they can only consume certain amount of information and certain amount of shows and stuff like that. The fact that you're choosing to tune into this show and listen to me talk about this stuff, uh, I'm very grateful that you're choosing me and that you're choosing this podcast to tune into and I really genuinely appreciate it. So thank you so much for supporting the show and uh, yeah, I'll see you next week on Thursday. Cheers guys. <laughs>